turn your, your Bibles with me. Our text today is 2 Chronicles. It's actually the ending of a message I, I started to preach uh, about two months ago called The Supernatural Keys to Victory. And I'm going to abbreviate my, my message. I'm not going to go, you know, this uh, elongated or long, uh, long sermon. But I want to get to the point that God is wanting to change your life. Hear me carefully. Mom can't change your life. Your husband cannot change your life. Wife, you can't change your husband. But God can change every one of us. And you need to pray. Listen to me. You have a spouse, and let's say he's not serving God. He's away from God. Well, what do I do, Pastor? First, live the Word of God before him as a testimony. Live like the Word of God instructs us to by being obedient to the Word. And pray the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray there would be such a conviction that he won't walk into a bar room, that when he even turns the car into the front, that he will literally get sick. Now, you say, oh, I couldn't do that. Then as Pastor David said, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're always going to get what you've always gotten. Now, Jehoshaphat learned because he had, he had become a confederate with Ahab. And do you know the greatest sin of Jehoshaphat? Because the Bible says, Wherefore, laying aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. Every one of us has a besetting sin. In other words, you have an area in your life where you are susceptible, where you are weak. And do you know what Jehoshaphat's besetting sin was? Now David's was lying. David's besetting sin was he lied. Look at him, even to the Philistines. He lied when he was telling uh, the king of the Philistines that when he asked him, can I stay in your land and I can be a blessing to you, and the king gave him a place to stay, and while the Philistines were out fighting, David and his band of men were out marauding Philistine villages and killing and pillaging areas from the king who was blessing him. And when he asked David, where have you been? Oh, we've just been out, you know, fighting against your enemies when in effect he was literally destroying them from behind. David's besetting sin was lying. Jehoshaphat's besetting sin was, listen, wasn't idols. Although idolatry had crept into Judah, we find after this debacle that he had at Ramoth Gilead with Ahab, then he turned his heart back to God. But what was his sin that did so easily beset him? Listen. You're probably waiting for something scandalous. His besetting sin was he liked being liked. You say, wow, that, that doesn't, that's not a sin. It can lead to sin. In the case of Jehoshaphat, how did it lead to sin? Well, Ahab was one of the worst kings in Israel's history. Israel was the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. And Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. Ahab was the king of Israel. The Bible says that Ahab lavished him with riches, goods, resources, but more importantly, he stroked his ego. My, what a great king you are. And you know, you could be even a greater king. You would be renowned. If you would come up to Samaria and bring your throne and the two of us will sit at the coming in of the city, we will sit there 
decked out in, in all of the celebration, all of the pomp and celebration, and everybody will say, look at these two great kings, how mighty they are, who are like these two kings. Only problem was Ahab was an idolater. He served idols. And behind his throne was the wicked woman Jezebel. Now listen to me. We talk about Jezebel all the time, but you cannot have a Jezebel or a, an Ahab or Jezebel without an Ahab. Because he let her run the kingdom and tell him what to do. Think about Nabal's vineyard. When Ahab went to Nabal and said, I want to buy your vineyard because it's right up against the palace. I'll pay you good money. And Nabal said, no, this has been in my family for many years. It's an heirloom. It's passed down. It's not for sale. So what did Ahab do? Like a great king would do, he went into his room and pouted. And he cried. And he whimpered. Real great king, wasn't he? Now listen. He married a princess whose father was a king of idolatry. When he married her, she brought all the idols of her father's kingdom into Israel, and Ahab led them in idolatry, pagan idolatry. And all of a sudden now, he is saying to a godly man, a man who was a great king, who had a heart for God, but he liked being liked. And when Ahab said, come up to Ramoth Gilead and we will engage the enemy, and he fell for the flattery. Flattery. How could that be a sin? Well, the flattery led to joining forces with a wicked king. The Bible says, what concord does darkness have with light? What relationship does Christ have with Beelzebub? Are we really any different when we enter into relationships with someone whose father is the father of darkness and our father is the father of light? How can there be any concord with someone who denies Christ, who doesn't live for Christ? How can we be in relationship with them? And so when they were together, Ahab said, by the way, you think this is great? Wait till we go out and conquer one of our enemies. We will come back and we will be two of the greatest kings in Israel's history. Jehoshaphat fell for it. Let's go. But God always gives a warning. Listen to me, child of God. You think you're about to make, you're about to make a step to commit to a relationship. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a business partner. Maybe it's just friends and, and guys or gals that you hang out with, the company that you keep. Oh, they're not bad people. They're good people. They just like to drink and have, have fun and party. No problem. I, I, I don't do drugs, but I like being with them. What concord does darkness have with light? How are you going to be a testimony to people who are using drugs and having casual sex? How is that going to lift you up? And here's a man in the form of, of Ahab who was so wicked and had turned the, the nation into such idolatry, idolatry that he could not, we could not even mention what they did in their, those booths that they had under every tree. Remember when God said through Jeremiah, tell me what tree have you not committed adultery under? Show me where you have not given yourselves over to idols. And by that, he meant literally they would bow the knee, but moreover, they would enter into these little chambers and they would have sex with prostitutes who led the idolatry and the worship to idols. What relationship? 
They went into battle. But Micaiah, the only true prophet, he warned them. When, when Jehoshaphat said to Ahab, I've heard your prophets, now I want to hear a prophet from Jehovah. He said, well, there's only one. His name's Micaiah, but he never says anything good about me. And Micaiah comes out, and he said to them, the king said to Micaiah, what say you? What does the Lord say? And he mockingly said to them, oh, yeah, go on out. God's going to give you a victory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take these bulls, you know, the horns that these guys have made. And, you know, one of them put these horns on his head, and he started running around and saying, this is what God's going to do to our enemies. And Micaiah knew it was a mockery. But listen to what he said. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. When you hear a man or a woman of God say, I saw the Lord, you better listen. When the prophets of God would say, I saw the Lord and his train fill the temple and his glory and the Shekinah was so great and the angels were all shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And Micaiah, when he said, I saw the Lord, and the Lord said, who will be a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab and the angels of the Lord were lined up and one of them stepped forward and said, I will go down and be a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets. And he said, go forth. And so all of these idolatrous and pagan prophets who were telling Ahab everything he wanted to see were false prophets who had a lying spirit upon them. And Jehoshaphat went out with them to battle. And they were summarily defeated. In fact, Ahab was mortally wounded when he disguised himself. He didn't want to be a king in battle. He was too fearful they would recognize him. So he tried to look like a common foot soldier. And someone randomly shot an arrow at him and hit him between his vest. And it mortally wounded him. He said, take me back to Samaria. When he went back, he had bled so much and died, and the dogs licked the blood of Ahab. Jehoshaphat went back to Jerusalem, and the prophet of God met him at the entry to Jerusalem, and he said, essentially just what I've said, what concord, what relationship does darkness have with light? Is it right to help those who hate the Lord and encourage those who have blasphemed his name? But there is something good found in you. And God will turn your situation around if you will turn to the Lord. Do you hear me, child of God? That's the beginning of 2018. If you will but turn to the Lord, he will return to you and God will begin to bless you. He'll bless your nation. He'll bless your home. He'll bless your kingdom. He'll bless your, pro your finances with prosperity. Yeah. Now listen, here's what happened. It says in verse 1 of chapter 20, came to pass after this, what Jehoshaphat did was he came back and he sent judges out throughout Judah and he said, you are now judging not for me, you are judging for the Lord. You are to be men of integrity. You are to live righteously. You are to judge righteously because you're judging not for me but God. And put away those dumb idols. You say, well, thank God we don't have idols today. Oh, really? Really? What about that big entertainment center that you spent all that money so you can watch some of the most rancid movies where they use some of the filthiest language and their lifestyles, the lifestyle of an alley cat, and you sit there with your children eating popcorn and drinking Coca-Cola or whatever, and you watch that filth 
That's an idol. You allow magazines to come in. You let your children get on the phone. God only knows what they're looking at after you have gone out of the room and you never even check to see what they're looking at. You know what? You can be consorting with evil spirits that have been brought in by someone else. You're saying, what are you saying, Pastor? I am saying that God is raising up a holy generation. He will not send revival to an unholy people who are practicing unholy things in their lives. A car can be an idol. Your home can be an idol. Your clothes can be an idol. Your relationship can be an idol. Your job can be an idol. Your title can be an idol. You may not bend your knee and worship it, but you give it your time, your money, your passion, all of those things. You give to that and you leave nothing for God. And what did he do? He said, judges, you judge righteously. And when he did this and he began to see a renaissance. He began to see revival in Judah. God began to change things. Let me tell you something. God cannot send revival as long as the altars are left in desolation as we saw in the life of Elijah. He had to rebuild the broken altars. Where is your altar? Where's your altar? In the home, where's your altar? Can your children tell you where your altar is? Can your children tell you where you pray? Can your wife tell you when you pray? Say, so, well, you know, she doesn't know everything. Oh, come on. Come on. You're the priest of the home. You're the one who are to pray for your children. You're the one to sit with them, hold their hands and say, listen, You need to put God as the priority of your life. If you want to be a lawyer or you want to be a doctor or you want to be a professional, you want to be one who is righteous, who is holy, who is different from that which is in the world so they will know we are his because we live and act differently. After that came to pass that the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they in Hazazon Tamar, which is in, in Gedi. You know what they said? Oh, you thought that there was just one army surrounding Jerusalem? There's another army over here, and there's another army over here, and there's one coming back here. And the Bible says, and Jehoshaphat feared. And Jehoshaphat feared. There's no sin when you hear bad news, when your heart suddenly fears. But you don't let your fear take over. You don't let your fear control you. The doctor comes in and he gives you a bad report. First thing that you do is you're fearful. And I appreciate, and I'm not going to say her name, but one of the ladies between the service was saying that over Christmas, she went into the, the hospital. She wasn't feeling well. She went in on the 23rd. And they ran some tests. Her blood pressure was very high. And uh, after they had done this battery of tests on her, wasn't a doctor. A lady came in and sat with her, and she said, I want to see your mouth, and I want you to, you know, grin at me, and I want you to pucker your lips and make all of these things, and she's writing notes. Yep, yep, you know, strokes look like that, and strokes act like that, and she said before long, she had basically convinced herself as the nurse or whatever she was and her that she had a stroke and she wasn't going to be able to speak and she said then she left my room and she said I literally had to shake myself and go in and look in the mirror and say you haven't had a stroke your tongue isn't tied 
Your mouth isn't drooping. This woman has been sent to give you something to be fearful about. And she said, I reject it and I will not accept it in the name of Jesus. She said, Pastor, how many people, they hear a report and the first thing they do, their heart runs away from them and they say, oh my God, I'm going to die. You're not feeling well? Well, you know, there's cancer of that kind. Oh, you have headaches? What kind? On the right side or the left side? Right side? Does it shoot down? Oh, my goodness. That could be a tumor. That could be cancer. Oh, my God. Cancer? Did you say cancer? And all they said is, that's my opinion. And the devil starts beating us up saying, you have cancer. Have you told all your kids you love them? Well, you better call them and tell them that you love them because you've got cancer. You don't have cancer. You have fear, and the enemy is trying to defeat you by putting words in your mouth, and you need to speak the word of life and the word of God over every sickness you have. Hallelujah. I told the early service when I was 17 years of age, I woke up one morning, I couldn't move my neck, and there was a bulge in my neck and behind my ear. My mother came in. I said, Mom, I can't move my neck. And, and she looked at it, and she felt there was a bulge on my neck. And she said, get dressed. We're going to the doctor. We went to the doctor. I think the appointment was at, I want to say, 1 o'clock. By 4 o'clock, I was in Cox Medical Center. And my parents came in a little bit later. Doctor came in. He examined me. Ran some tests. But he sat me down and my parents, and he said, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I believe that we're looking at Hodgkin's disease and the good news is if we have caught it early enough, you stand about an 80% chance of living a normal life if we caught it early enough. And I look at my mom and dad, I'm thinking, are you going to let him talk to me this way? I mean, if you have, if you're lucky and, and things are good, you stand a good chance of living a, a, a good life. I won't say you'll live a long life. He's sitting and pronouncing my, basically my death warrant. And he walked out. And my parents prayed over me. I got phone calls from the girls in the youth group at church. I'd pick up the phone and, and they would, you know, say who they were, and then they'd start crying. Oh, you've been such a good guy. We've loved you. I'm like, why are these people pronouncing my death? And then my grandmother, she came in. And my grandmother sat down next to me, and I said, Grandma, the doctor and the surgeon are going to come in in just a few moments. And she said, well, they'll just have to wait. And she looked over by my bed, bed stand, and there was Jovan grass oil. It was green. My brother, he would wear jo Jovan musk oil. I, I had the Jovan grass oil. So my, my grandmother looks at this grass oil, and she says, the Bible says to anoint with oil. I'm going to take that oil. I said, Grandma, that's cologne. That's not oil. She said, it's, it says oil. I said, but Grandma, it's cologne. So she walks over, and she gets this grass oil. She takes the top off, and it wasn't one of those spray things. It was the kind, you know, you shake out. She shook out, it seemed like, half the bottle. And she starts doing this. I'm not kidding you. She, you know, she's, like, slapping it across me and hitting my neck. And, my, and finally, she says this. I hear her praying. Father... I prophesied over this boy when he was three years old that he would be a minister of the gospel and that prophecy has not been fulfilled and the devil cannot take his life. He is healed in the name of Jesus. And then she started speaking in tongues and I had one eye closed in deference to her, one eye open in reference to the doctor and surgeon. She's speaking in tongues. She decides to do a Pentecostal jig. You know, she's getting excited. 
Kind of like Joshua did. You know, I, I'm going to learn that. I'm going to learn that spin. I mean, first, you could smell this grass oil all through the hallways. You could hear my grandmother speaking in tongues in every room. And the, the doctor and the surgeon were very nice. They came and they bowed their heads. And then when, they, when she was through, and I'm sitting there with this green substance just pouring down my chest. And the doctor had been in earlier, and, you know, he felt it. And so he told the surgeon, he said, uh, check him out. It's on the right side. And he comes over and he wipes the oil off my neck. And he said, uh, I'm not impressed. The doctor said, what are you talking about? He said, I don't feel any goiter or, or any egg size growth. And I'm telling you exactly what was said now. The doctor turned red. And he said, it was there 10 minutes ago. And he came up to me and he felt. And he mumbled under his breath. I don't remember what he said, but it was under his breath. And he said, I swear to you, doctor, it, there was a goose-sized egg that was protruding out of his neck. And I don't know what happened or what was done, but it's not here now. But there is a little bump behind his ear. And he said, I'd like for you to feel of that. So he comes over and he feels behind my ear. And he says, I'm not impressed. My mom had come in by that time, and he said to my mom, if this were my son, I'd take him home. But I will do a biopsy behind his ear if you want me to check. I have a scar behind it right now. And they did the biopsy. They sent me home. I was in high school PE the next week. Somebody brought me a message from the office, and it said, your test came back. They're all benign. There's no cancer. Hear me. There were people that were praying for me, but it was a grandmother's prayer who refused to accept what the doctor said. And I thank God for doctors, but listen to me. They don't have the final word. God is the final adjudicator. He is the final one who says yes or no. And I was healed and I'm here today because of the power of Jesus Christ. I don't care what your diagnosis is. God has the final word. Hallelujah. When you first hear the news, your heart may fear, but you don't hold on to fear. You cast it down and you hold to the word of God. I walk by faith, not by sight. I walk by faith, not by feeling. There are some days I wake up, I don't feel anything. But I am a child of God. I have been blood bought. I am an overcomer. I am more than a conqueror through Christ. I am victorious. And God will provide for every need that I have. Hallelujah. And what did they do? They got all of the people together. If we want to have revival, folks, there's got to be unity. There can't be that. I mean, there can't be division. There can't be people who disagree with one another. If we're going to see revival, we need to be just like Jehoshaphat and Judah. They all came together. Their families, their kindred, they all came in one place. And he said, hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou King Jehoshaphat. This is the prophet of God. Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid. Everybody say that. Be not afraid. Say it again. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Don't you be afraid, that's fear, or dismayed, that's confusion. When you're fearful, you're totally confused. 
Don't be fearful. Don't be dismayed. This battle is not yours. It is God's, and he will conquer your enemy. Some of you right now, you need to release the burden you've been carrying, the fear you've been carrying, the unsettledness that you've embraced. You need to let it go and say, but God will deliver me. The bank calls you. You know you're overdrawn. You say, tell me something new. Well, we may have to foreclose. Okay, what else? Well, I hope you can do something about it, but I don't want to foreclose, but if you leave me no other choice, then I'll foreclose. God bless you. Thank you for the wonderful call. You're edifying and uplifting, but uh, let me call you next time. Put the phone down, and don't you declare, I'm poor, I have no money, I live in poverty. I'm a mendicant beggar. I come from a poor family. I'm from a poor country, and we just don't have the money. Let me tell you something. You may not have it in your possession, but your God owns the cattle of a thousand hills and all the mineral beneath it. You are a son, a child of God. You lack for nothing. And 2018, he's going to turn your business, he's going to turn your finances, he's going to turn your life around. Stand to your feet with me right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I am not defeated. I said I am not defeated. I am an overcomer through him who loves me. Too many of us are walking around like beggars. Quit acting like a beggar. Your father will take care of all of your needs. Hallelujah. 2018 is going to be the best year for you financially you have had in over 20 years. Listen to me. This is going to be the best year financially for you, for your family, for this church. And God is going to bless you if you are obedient to his word. When the people went out to confront the enemy, they got up early, the Bible says. You know when you dread something? Maybe the bank your boss, a relationship that you need to deal with. You dread it and you just don't want to get up. You don't want to get out of bed. You, I don't want to deal with this today. I just I want to put, all, put it off as long as I can. Children of Israel, the Bible says, they got up early. I love that. When you're excited and you're expecting something great, you don't stay in bed till noon. You get up early because you're expecting a victory. You get up early because you know something good is going to happen to you. And then the Bible says they went out and faced their enemy. You've got to face your problem. God's not going to say, you go hide in a corner and then I'll go take care of your battle. What did David do? When David went into the engagement of the battle of Goliath, the Bible says he ran toward him. He wasn't cowering. He wasn't nervous. He ran to him and he told him, today I'm going to take your head off your shoulders. Does that sound fearful to you? He said, you come in the name of your God's You uncircumcised Philistine, but I come in the name of the Lord. And I'm going to defeat you today. And then the children of Israel, they put the singers in front and they went out praising God. Listen, how did they praise him? They praised him, the Bible says, in the beauty of holiness. Listen to me, church. In the beauty of holiness. God is looking in these last days for a holy people. He's looking, hear me, he's looking for a church. 
He's looking for a contingency. He's looking for a people who will be holy and righteous and separate from the world. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye different, says the Lord. When we come, we worship Him in the beauty of holiness. Jesus Christ is not a part-time lover. He's not a weekend pickup. You pick Him up on Friday and you let Him off on Monday. He is the priority of your life. You are a righteous seed and the righteous seed is blessed because of our federal head, Jesus Christ, has made us in the image of God. Hallelujah. How many of you right now need a miracle in your life? Let me see your hand. How many of you believe, listen, I know you believe in miracles, but I want to ask, how many of you believe God is going to do a miracle in your life? Would you raise your hand right now? I want everyone to lift their hands, and I want you to praise him in the beauty of holiness. He is a holy God, and I want us to worship him in holiness, in righteousness, and in spiritual truth. Father, you are holy. You are righteous. There is none like you. Who is like unto our God? Lord, there is no one. There is no one like you. Father, we thank you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. You are a holy God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give him praise, church. Hallelujah. There's someone right now, you have been facing renal failure. You've had problems with your kidneys. Just like the young man we've prayed for. God is going to touch and heal your kidneys. Do I, do I hear a witness? God is going to heal your kidneys. There's someone here that they have found a spot in your liver. There's something there, a mass of some kind that they have spotted. The doctors have tried to feel your mind that, that it's a tumor or it's a mass of cancer. But God, but God is going to touch you and heal you. And in the name of Jesus, I declare healing by the blood of Jesus over your mortal body. God is your healer. He is the great physician. He's the great physician. He's going to heal your kidneys. He's going to touch your liver. I will not receive the report of the enemy. I receive the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. Can you say amen to that? I choose to believe his report. Father, I am healed. I want you to raise your hands right now. I want you to say this prayer with me. Father, I am healed. In the name of Jesus, there is no disease that is upon my life. Lord, you will determine when you take me home and I am blood bought, I am saved by the word of God and the testimony of my own lips. I am not poor. I am not a beggar. All of my needs are met. I have financial abundance through him who loves me. My children are covered by the blood of Jesus. And not one of them shall be lost because they will remember the word of the Lord. And my church shall prosper in 2018 
and revival will come with the Spirit of God. I declare it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give praise to his name. Give praise to his name. He is mighty. He is a conquering king. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, your children are here today. We began this year as the righteous people of God. Lord, you're going to multiply. You're going to increase. You're going to anoint and heal. And I receive it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen and amen. God bless you for being with us today.